My name is Michelle Gell, and I'm happy to be here and talk about this important subject, which has been my research interest for some years now. And I would like to thank the OECD for inviting me to take part in this important discussion. So let me start by sharing my screen. Okay, so the starting point for our analysis is of course that data is important for the digital economy. And uh, we can think about more and better data that affects the quality of products, but there's also a feedback loop here uh, where uh, uh, more and better data transfers into better algorithms, which then can translate into better products or better services. So if firms need data for their uh, um, operations, how do they get this data? Okay. So there are several ways that firms can uh, uh, receive uh, their data. What I would like to um, focus here is on receiving it um, based on non-voluntary transactions. These are transactions which are which may be mandated by law, for example. However, a lot of what I'm going to say is going to be relevant also to setting standards. Um, in an industry, which if you would like, is like a macro issue um, in this regard. So uh, the question that um, I would like to touch upon is whether decreasing interoperability and portability um, standards is an antitrust effect. So let me start with the theory of harm. The theory of harm is that the use of data portability and interoperability uh, um, standards to indirectly foreclose partly or fully access of rivals to an input, here it is of course data, which they might have otherwise legally accessed in a way designed to negatively affect rivals' ability to compete. So if we want to put this simply, we are talking about actually creating artificial barriers to data flows in the market. Now, when this is applied to private data, what it might uh, uh, create is increased switching costs, thereby strengthening consumer lock-in and limiting multi-homing, and it might also prevent data subjects from enjoying the benefits uh, from their data. Now, with regard to antitrust, it might be relevant in two main instances. First, as an offense by itself, and that might be in the context of an agreement in restraint of trade or abuse of dominance, or it might be a consideration in merger control. Now, what I would like to suggest are six uh, different requirements that need to exist for an antitrust defense to arise here, okay? So, uh, um, uh, so the, this is uh, the first that the data is important uh, uh, for competition um, in the market. And it might be data that is already collected or it can be collected by the infringer. Um, of course, what is important is the feasibility of the use of this certain data by other firms uh, for example, this specific data must be relevant to their operation because uh, uh, we know that um, data is um, not, um, data is, it might be of different kinds and different types. And I would suggest that data need not be essential, but it's sufficient if limited access to it can ra rise ra rivals costs significantly. And I also suggest that there's no need to specify in minute detail how rivals will use the data. Um, the second element here is there are significant uh, barriers to access to such data. Um, and again, we know that data is a public good, yet not all data are equal. Um, so if you have one type of data and your rival has another type of data, doesn't necessarily mean that you can compete effectively. There should be high barriers um, to access that data that you need. It might be technological, legal, financial, um, um, to the collection of uh, uh, such data. There's no easy way to circumvent 
uh, uh, this. For example, a lot of people are talking about content scraping, but I would add to that that um, uh, you might employ algorithms that simply need less data and compete with them. And my suggestion here is were data transfers mandated by law, that we can assume that there are high entry barriers. Otherwise, why do we need the law? The third condition is that there are no legal constraints on the transfer of that specific data. And um, that can come from security laws, from privacy laws, from data ownership. And this requires um, determining the priorities among laws, which is an important subject beyond what, I'm, uh, what I have time for uh, today. Again, my suggestion is where data transfer is mandated by law, that this can be assumed. The fourth um, element here is that da data transfer increases wealth. Uh, and here we have to take into account um, the competition that will create, the synergies, the data synergies, the product and service synergies that it creates, and the extended network effects in that market. The analysis, of course, must be long-term analysis, focusing on the um, motivations of firms to collect data that might result from it. And of course, there might be counter justifications. For example, uh, if um, uh, limited data access is needed to significantly improve privacy or data security beyond what is uh, mandated by law. And here I would suggest to apply um, uh, one suggestion that was made uh, reversing the burden of proof so that the burden should be on the dominant firm restricting multi-homing to demonstrate the efficiencies associated with these actions. And again, my suggestion is where data transfer is mandated by law, this can be assumed. The fifth element is that the infringer's actions affect data interoperability and portability in a way which significantly limits data transfers. So it affects the ability to use the infringer's own data by others. It might be through dark patterns for consent, for example. I'll show you um, um, uh, this uh, slide. This, I think, is in an interesting example of all kinds of dark patterns that firms use in order to limit the consent, uh, which is mandated by law. And also, uh, the infringement action can directly or indirectly affect the setting of data uh, interoperability and portability standards in the industry. Sixth and last condition is that such actions create a comparative advantage to the one limiting interoperability and portability. And this can be directly through B2B actions or indirectly through B2C. Uh, uh, thereby increasing user switching costs. And so these are, I think, the elements that have to um, always exist. There's also an institutional wise one, I think, that I think that it requires a more technological approach, thereby uh, requiring uh, also data scientists or computer scientists to be part of the enforcement uh, process. Okay, so. Does this translate into antitrust uh, um, prohibitions? It definitely might. And let me uh, um, just put here uh, several, and um, this exists, um, this list um, can also be found in the excellent OECD background paper. So with regard to unilateral conduct, it might be opportunistic setting of substandards. It might be de facto bundling, exclusivity, self-preferencing, margin screen strategy, or excessive pricing for access to data. With regard to joint conduct, it might be joint opportunistic uh, setting of substandards for interoperability and portability. And with regard to merger review, uh, there are market uh, contestability considerations that, have, um, that are affected by um, interoperability and portability of course, also refusal to supply with regard to unilateral conduct. 
Now, let me spend just a few more minutes on data interoperability and portability as a remedy. So the relevance here is first, degradation and limitation of interoperability or portability might by themselves be an antitrust offense, or they might be part of a remedy for a strong competition in the market to enable data sharing and even as an alternative to structural remedies. And what are the benefits here? The benefits is, first of all, we limit anti-competitive conduct or its consequences. It may introduce competition in the market, but also competition for the market. It might uh, apply both to firms, standalone firms, and within ecosystems. And also remedies can be flexibly designed according to the situation in a given market. Are there limitations? Of course, many that have to be taken into account. First of all, time is the essence in digital markets. And here we're talking about ex post regulation. Um, also, antitrust applies in a specific case. It's not uh, the setting of market wide standards. The devil is in the details. Um, uh, uh, the authority or the enforcer would have to determine standards and terms and limit what I might call pretended sharing of data where you actually uh, um, do not um, enable the real sharing of the data. It might require substantial oversight. It's often not standalone. As um, uh, in my work with um, uh, Dan Rubenfeld, for example, we have suggested also looking at the need for data standardization in some industries. Its effectiveness is affected by the ability to mitigate data protection concerns. It's also affected by user consent and behavior limitations. And uh, in some situations, market transparency might facilitate collusion. And there's a risk of discouraging investment in data collection. There are also implementation costs. And here, one question to ask is, do the standards that uh, we um, apply create comparative advantages to some firms over others? And in my work with um, um, Ophrita Viv, I've suggested that the OECD, for example, creates um, uh, benefits to the large firms over smaller firms for, uh, um, a mo for multiple reasons. There's also a question if there's better alternatives. And one that I would like to suggest is maybe sharing the learning, sharing the algorithm, rather than sharing the data itself. And finally, there might be economies of scale from data transfer, and these might be uh, limited uh, uh, for uh, different reasons. So let me stop here, and um, I will um, show um, some of the resources that I've uh, mentioned. And, and thank you for uh, thank you very much.